I raised my leg real high and I kicked the door as hard as I could. The door opened and this big man was standing there with a switchblade knife in his hand. certainly would prefer that this interview be conducted without having to wear these sunglasses, but my wife Sharon and I went to uh, Scottsdale, Arizona a few years ago to the Mayo Clinic there, and three, do three different doctors diagnosed me as having an autoimmune disease by the name of myasthenia gravis and certainly I'm not 100% sure I have that, but I do have to wear these sunglasses because bright lights cause me to have double vision, blurred vision, and my, the pain is increased greatly by having to uh, be so sensitive to sunlight or even uh, lights that are above me in the room here. My name is Carl Johnson Howell, Jr. I was born at Norton Hospital in Louisville on May 27, 1942. I had two great role models in my life, and one was my father and the other was my grandfather. With my grandfather, whose name was James Richard Howell, more commonly known in the community as Jim Howell, the glass was always half full. He was an amazing man who did in a lot of different things in his life. He was very outgoing and loved children. He would always have a dime or a quarter or some coin in his pocket to give them. Uh, the first job he had was at his father's mill, the Howell Mill, in a little community known as Malt. It's in the Balha section of LaRue County. And on the other side of the mill, was the Malt General Store and the Malt Post Office. Back in those days, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, that was a thriving little community. After he finished his work uh, with my great-grandfather, Mace Howell, he became a deputy U.S. Marshal. On or about the year 1915, he ran for the Kentucky House of Representatives, and he won that election. He later became sheriff of LaRue County uh, in 1922, and he served one term as sheriff of LaRue County. He, uh, at one point in time, became the mayor of Hodgenville, and he served in that capacity, I believe in the 1940s, for two terms. He also purchased the Hodgenville Roller Mill, and he ran that for about 15 to 20 years. For those of you that are wondering where that may be located, it was located right across from where Phelps Heating and Cooling now is located, and the uh, grain silo a cylindrical, kind of cream-colored structure is still standing. My grandfather's main objective was to do something to honor Abraham Lincoln. And in 1926, give or take a year, he purchased about 35 acres of land that adjoined the Abraham Lincoln Birthplace Park. And in 1928, he built a, a building that he named the Nancy Lincoln Inn after Abraham Lincoln's mother. It was made out of chestnut logs and was constructed just a few years before the chestnut blight came through this area of the country. And the next year, uh, 19. 29, he built the four adjoining cabins, also out of chestnut logs, and they were used to be to rent to uh, tourists 
uh, who visited the park. It wasn't until uh, 1929 that he first began uh, using the Nancy Lincoln Inn as a restaurant. It was in, always used as a souvenir shop and museum. The Nancy Lincoln Inn was where I'd usually spend my time with my grandfather, and I dearly loved that man, and he uh, was a great inspiration to me. My father's name was Carl Howell. Of course, now after I was born, he was known as Carl Howell Sr., and he went to Hodgenville Graded School. After he got out of high school, he knew he wanted to go to the University of Kentucky. He went to the University of Kentucky undergraduate school and law school, going mostly not only during the regular semesters, but in the summers. He would go to summer school. He got his degree, undergraduate degree, and his law degree in five and a half years. During the time he was an undergraduate student at the University of Kentucky, his brother, James Richard Howe Jr., was enrolled in high school in Hodgen, at Hodgenville, and he got very ill. He had a problem breathing, and uh, he went to a pulmonary doctor, and the doctor told him that if he was going to survive, he needed to go to a state with a much warmer climate. My dad's mother asked my father if he would go with James Richard, his brother, who was five and a half years younger than my dad, uh, to someplace in father in, in uh, Florida, and he agreed to go to Stetson University for one year. And they lived there together, my grandmother, my dad, and his brother. And while he was there, enrolled in Stetson University at DeLand, Florida, he met my mother. And uh, they fell in love, and in a few years' time, they got married. And he met her one day at the New Haven, uh, Kentucky Railroad Depot, and that was the first time she'd ever seen snow. He was more introverted than my grandfather. Uh, he loved to read. He would read a book a day or maybe in two days. And uh, he would always get a, a list of Reader's Digest words. The Reader's Digest would have 20 words and they would, uh, he would bring it to work when we started practicing law. And he would make sure that I knew every word the next day and he would ask me to use it in a sentence. Now there I was, I was already out of law school, but he would make sure that I was able to uh, improve my learning a little bit. After, after my father uh, got out of law school, got his degree in 1936, he decided to enlist in the Army. And he attained the rank of major in a short time, relatively short time. He and a group of uh, fellow attorneys that were serving in the U.S. Army uh, were told that they needed to condemn or by the process of eminent domain have deeded by the court a large boundary of land that was going to be used by the government for some major purposes but they were never told what this was to be used for. My father later learned after the bombing in Hiroshima that the land in Oak Ridge, Tennessee that had been acquired by his team of attorneys was actually used for the development of the atomic bomb. I don't know if the judges had any knowledge of that but my dad told me that everything involved in the process of the eminent domain cases uh, went by real quickly and very smoothly. At some point in time, he was presented with a, what I believe to be a prototype of uh, a shell casing that was resembling or identical to an atomic bomb like the one that was the ones that were used in Hiroshima. 
After he finished his term in the Army, he moved to Hodgenville, like I said earlier, and uh, began practicing law. Being born in 1942, uh, my earliest memories uh, of Hodgenville uh, were actually uh, going to town. Uh, I only lived about two, two and a half blocks from downtown and uh, went to church at the Baptist Church in Hodgenville. And uh, my best friend growing up through uh, the elementary school years and high school years was Terry Sandage. There were many businesses, uh, far more businesses in Hodgenville than we have at the present time. And uh, the movie theater uh, that was there first was the Masonic Theater, which is next to the Woman's Club building. And uh, I can remember talking to a friend uh, who had his first date uh, with a young lady, and he was only about 11 or 12 years old. And this was around 1950. And he had saved up a quarter. And he took this young lady to the movies at the Masonic Theater. It cost nine cents to get in. So that's 18 cents he spent on his girlfriend and himself. And he, while he was there, he bought a bag of popcorn for a nickel. And then after the, the movies were over, they left and he bought for one cent a Tootsie Roll for her and one cent for the Tootsie Roll for him. And he had spent his entire quarter that day. Inflation has certainly taken its toll. I attended Hodgenville Elementary School and uh, Hodgenville High School. And I graduated uh, in the first class of LaRue County High School, which was the 1958-59 year. There had been a Buffalo High School, a Magnolia High School, and a Hodgenville High School. And this was the first year there was a LaRue County High School. Corky Cox was my baseball coach. He was, of course, the basketball coach and was a great coach. He uh, uh, was very competitive. He coached me three years and I lettered four years in baseball, three years at Hodgenville and my senior year at LaRue County High School. Sophomore and junior years at Hodgenville High School, uh, rather than eat the food that was served in the cafeteria at Hodgenville, a group of us would run all the way to Hodgenville's uh, little grill down there by Red Hazel's building, and we would eat a bowl of chili, a hot dog or a hamburger, and then we'd run all the way back up to the school and start playing ball. There was a time that Tommy Hazel ran the uh, Hazel Hotel, and... Uh, he was wanting to sell it, and he talked to my father about it, and uh, they came to terms just almost spontaneously, and my father bought the building. It was a hotel at that time. It wasn't used for anything else, and when Dad bought it, uh, it was a walkout deal. The check was written, and the restaurant was no longer used but it had a lot of frozen goodies in the ice box, our refrigerator. And Terry Sandage and I were there about the time it was, they were having a closing and dad let us eat all the ice cream we could eat. So we invited some friends in and in a matter of a few minutes, we had devoured all the ice cream there in the, uh, that Tommy Hazel had saved. I can't remember what year it was, but it was in the uh, early, to mid 50s, a famous evangelist by the name of Angel Martinez came to the LaRue County Fairgrounds and it was so advertised that a huge throng of people attended it. And when he finished, there were a massive number of conversions. Uh, it was kind of like 
Billy Graham of the day. And uh, I know that a number of my closest friends and, and myself, uh, among those that went down and after the sermon was over, he would come back, he came back and talked to us and uh, suggested that we go to our church of choice and uh, pro make a profession of faith and become baptized. I think it was around 1953 or 54, a lot of boys, including Terry and me, began collecting baseball cards. There were only two companies that produced baseball cards, Topps and Bowman. And we would, whenever we had any spare change, we would go to Terrell's store or one of the other stores in the area and buy baseball cards. Uh, this was during the time that Mickey Mantle rookied in 1952. Hank Aaron was a rookie in 1954. In 1955, Roberto Clemente and Sandy Koufax were rookies. And those cards, among many others, uh, to this day have extreme, extremely high values and are purchased at auctions. But we were interested in collecting cards for the entire set. The sets would sometimes be 200, 250, post, uh, uh, 250 uh, baseball cards. But one thing that Terry and I would do, and there were a couple of other friends of ours would do, is we would look on the back of the cards and it would tell where they lived. It would give their address. So during the off season, uh, Terry and I would try to write maybe five letters a day and we would write to these ball players and tell them they were either our favorite ball player or one of our favorite ball players, and could they send us a postcard of themselves. I was a Milwaukee Braves and a Cleveland Indians fan, and I still to this day have all the postcards that they sent to us. With the baseball cards in the Tops and Bowman packs, there would be a slab of bubble gum that would generally be crackly and not that great to chew. But we would think that we needed to do that anyway, so we would go ahead and uh, consume the bubble gum uh, as if it were something we should do. We, we never uh, would put our baseball cards in the spokes of our of of bicycles like many of our friends would do. Uh, that was not, we actually believed that they would someday have value. After graduating from LaRue County High School, I'd always wanted to go to the University of Kentucky. So I did uh, as a freshman. And uh, along about March of that freshman year, I got two telephone calls one, on the same day. One of them was from Jimmy Taylor. He was a very close friend of mine that graduated two years ahead of me in high school and was a good baseball player and was at Campbellsville College, not university, but at that time it was Campbellsville College. And he was one of the better baseball players. And he called to ask me if I could come to Campbellsville College uh, and transfer from the University of Kentucky and be on the baseball team at the college. He said the starting first baseman was graduating that year and he knew that I, would, I could make the team and be the first baseman. And then Terry Sandage called me later on that same day and said that he was going to Camelsville College and that he was going uh, to try to make the team. So... I notified my father that I would like very much if he would agree and let me uh, leave the University of Kentucky and go to Campbellsville College because more than anything, I wanted to play baseball in college. He allowed me to do that, and I played for two years and was the first baseman for the college team. I had the second highest batting average in 1961 and two. When I got through with my third year of college, 
I learned that there was no way I could get in law school. By that time, I had decided to go to law school and hopefully uh, come back and practice law with my father. But the credits I earned at Campbellsville College, many of them would not translate into a ability to go to the University of Kentucky uh, because you had to have 128 hours of certain subjects and some of the religious courses that I took at Campbellsville College wouldn't transfer. So I ended up going to Georgetown College and uh, I had to take 37 hours my uh, senior year and graduated from Georgetown College with a major in English, but I would have much rather preferred to stay at Campbellsville College so I could have played another year of baseball. After graduating from Georgetown College, I went to the University of Kentucky College of Law and uh, for three years, and I got my degree there. And during the uh, second semester of my third and last year of, at the University of Kentucky Law School, uh, we had a visitor from the FBI that came and spoke to us about people trying to enlist people to the FBI and that could become a special agent as the requirements to be an agent was you could either have a law degree or be a certified public accountant with three years experience. That was the only classification that you could have and uh, apply for uh, being an agent in, uh, with the FBI. Now, uh, I talked that over with my father and he said, well, if that's something you'd like to do, go ahead. I entered on duty uh, in Quantico, Virginia, in Washington, D.C., in September of 1966. And uh, my training at Quantico and at Washington, D.C. was quite intensive. I learned quite a bit, and uh, I, I loved every minute of it. During the latter part of the month of December, we were all told what offices we would be going to. And a friend of mine and I were sent to Buffalo, New York. That was not our office of preference, but nonetheless, uh, that's where we went. About a month before we uh, finished our uh, training uh, with the FBI, we all got to meet J. Edgar Hoover. And that was quite an experience because we were warned that there had been several people over the years that had sweaty palms or did not make eye contact with Mr. Hoover when they were in the long line that were gonna be shaking his hand. For the one and only time we would have the opportunity to meet uh, Director Hoover who had been the director all the way back through eight presidents, beginning with Calvin Coolidge. So I remember that we were supposed to have dry palms, wear a nice necktie and sport coat, a white shirt, and that we should have something either rather witty or at least intelligent to say to him during our 30-second meeting with him. So, uh, one of the amusing things was the, it was all alphabetical, and the first person in line to meet J. Edgar Hoover was a classmate of mine named J. Edgar Barkas. So I remember, you know, that we were all a little bit nervous until Mr. Hoover uh, got a kick out of meeting someone with uh, his first two names being like his, but. Several people asked me after we met J. Edgar Hoover, what did you say to Mr. Hoover that was either witty, clever, or intelligent? I said, well, I didn't know uh, what to say, but when I met him, I had remembered reading that he had been a horse racing fan, and he and Clyde Tolson uh, used to go to the races a lot. So I thought I would be kind of uh, witty, and I told Mr. Hoover, I said, Mr. Hoover, I'm from Kentucky, 
And I've been to the Kentucky Derby. Uh, and if you ever need any assistance in getting good seats for the Derby, I'm your man. Fortunately, that cornball statement uh, uh, reverberated well with him. And he laughed and said, I'll remember that, Agent Hal. When I arrived in Buffalo, uh, I was greeted warmly. And uh, a friend who was uh, in my class with me, Ralph Hamner and I, shared rental payments at an apartment. And we were able to make it for a while. Uh, the, one of the good things about uh, my experience in Buffalo is that Somehow, the special agent in charge, uh, Neil Welch, uh, took a liking to me and put me on his squad. There were three squads. The boss's squad, which is the special agent in charge. The ASAC squad, which was the assistant special agent in charge squad. And the third squad, which meant that if you were on that squad, you'd be doing accounting work and you'd be in the office all day, which nobody wanted to do, at least none of my friends did, nor I. So I was the only first office agent on the SAC squad, and I was able to handle cases like the mafia cases, kidnapping, extortion, bank robberies, and the, apprehensive, the apprehension of fugitives. Now, I enjoyed that very much. It seemed like every Friday there was a bank robbery. Uh, but I enjoyed more than anything working the mafia cases with a an older agent whose name was Jim Laleem. He had been sent to Monterey, California at, while he was an agent for the sole purpose of learning how to speak Italian and Sicilian fluently. For five and a half years, he was in Monterey learning that. He and I were able to go together to develop informants in the mafia. That was quite an experience because one of the seven mafia families was centered in Buffalo and Niagara Falls. It was the Steve Magadino family. He was one of the seven most important mafia members uh, in all of the United States. Uh, after I uh, was finishing my year at Buffalo, in Buffalo, I got married to Mary Catherine Strack. Uh, my wife and I later had five daughters, Christy, Dana, Kara Page, Brittany, and Ashley. While I was in Buffalo, Jim Laleem uh, ad advised me that I could be a part of a, a really interesting case that would be covered by all of the news media on this particular night. Uh, there was going to be a raid by state police, sheriff's department, and the FBI in Buffalo of this place called Panero's Lounge in North Tonawanda, which was a suburb of Buffalo. I was honored to be invited because none of the other first office agents had the opportunity to go. During the process of making apprehensions of um, a number of the uh, mafia members, someone noticed that there was a trap door that led to the cellar. And we decided to see if anyone was down there. And sure enough, some of the more important mafia members were down there and they were playing cards. And there was a young man who had just got out of law school and he was being groomed to be the mafia's attorney. And we found that out later. But as we were descending this staircase, someone pushed me from behind and I stumbled. And as I went down into the cellar, I hit one of the, age, one of the uh, mafia members uh, real hard with my arms as I was trying to catch myself when I was falling. His head hit the floor so hard that I could hear it crack and I thought I might have killed him, I didn't know. But the fellow who was being groomed as the attorney for the mafia 
I was able to overhear him make a comment to his buddy. He said, get his name, speaking of me. Well, I hope they didn't get my name, or really right now I don't care. But at the time, I was quite concerned. After I left Buffalo, New York, uh, they, I was sent to New York City. And while at New York City, we did, the squad I was on uh, did surveillances of uh, Soviet spies. And I was assigned five Russians that I would be trying to keep tabs on and learn what they were doing, who they were meeting, and why. Uh, one time someone asked me uh, how dangerous some of this was, and I had several dangerous uh, assignments, but the one that I remember most was in Buffalo. And I got a phone call about four o'clock one morning from an agent that I didn't know very well, but he and his friend, the other agent, were about a year or two away from retirement. And they had been tracing or following this fellow who had entered a house, and they knew that he was in the house, and they were a little afraid of him because he was uh, a fugitive and known to be dangerous and carry a firearm or knife or something like that. And he had already, uh, I think he had been charged with several serious felonies. So they called me and asked if I would come join them to help apprehend him. So like I said, I didn't know those two agents very well, but nonetheless I went and I met them and they told me, they said, one of us is gonna go in the front door, and one of us is gonna go in the back door, and we'll scour around in the main floor, and you go upstairs to the second floor and see if, you could, if he's up there. Well, I didn't like the way that sounded, really, but I had to take orders. So what happened was we entered the house, and uh, they were scouring around in the main level, and they told me to go upstairs. Well, I did have a flashlight, and I was carrying my 38 revolver. So I got upstairs, and it was pitch black. I, I, I didn't find any lights to turn on, but I did have my flashlight. And very carefully, I was going from one room to another, and I opened every door to every room except the bathroom while I was on the second floor but it was eerily silent. And I put my ear up against the, bath, the bathroom door and I could actually hear someone breathing on the other side of the door. So I stood back and I said, open the door and come out, you're under arrest. Nothing happened. So. I raised my leg real high and I kicked the door as hard as I could. The door opened and this big man was standing there with a switchblade knife in his hands. So I backed up and told him not to move to raise his hands and the two other agents, when I called them, came up and one of them handcuffed him and that was that. Was that. <laughs> 